Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we have uh, a guest called Zian Hutton uh, on with us. And the reason why we've got Zian on here is this, um, a little bit of a background. I have met Zian probably about 15 to 18 years ago when we worked for the same organization. Um, I left that organization and Zion actually then went on to, to become a managing director of another organization and he'll tell you all about that. And then about, what was this, about 10 years ago, or eight years ago, I got interviewed by Zion and I went to, to I went and worked for him uh, in his organization and we've done a lot of interesting stuff through through that experience and through the through the organization and Zion will will go into that with us for today but Zion qualifies as a really good guest for us here because he has uh, been uh, at the forefront of new ways of working and helping organizations implement that through his organization uh, that, the, that he was the managing director of. And um, he's had some really interesting experiences in the oversight and governance space. And that's why we wanted to talk to Zion. We also have to fully disclose uh, that Zion is also part of Novavi. Um, and we're very happy to have him uh, on on board as a as a guide and and as a as a as a, a co-worker in in Novavi. Now that's me, um, Zion. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and your experience, your river of love? Okay, All right. So I think we because the. The, the main topic of, of what we're discussing today is oversight or governance or governance and compliance or whatever terminology you want to use. I think I'd maybe share a bit of my background and how I've sort of experienced that in my life. So although I spent probably the the, the bulk of my uh, life or, or probably the, the, the last 15 odd years in helping organizations with ways of work and software development best practices and methods and frameworks, etc. Um, I wasn't always that person. I, I started my career in working in a bank. And I, I wasn't working in the IT department. I wasn't working in the organizational development department. I was work, working as a banker. I was a true blue banker. Um, and so my first, first exposure to oversight was really in that world where for the first uh, and probably the most valuable thing I learned there was um, the need for for some level of conflict and tension to exist when it comes to oversight um, and and that uh, uh, that that pretty much came about because initially uh, in my early part as my career as a banker I was very much in the credit side of banking and I did credit applications and I was a credit manager and then at some point I was promoted and I became a branch manager. And, and it's an interesting animal when you become a branch manager because now, aside from being responsible for, for credit, you're also responsible for marketing. And that becomes very difficult because you've got uh, the conflict now existing in one person. So whereas previously I was the bad credit guy that was always saying no, and yet the marketing guys always trying to convince you to give credit to people that didn't deserve it, uh, you, you, you end up being that person who... Who, who embodies both these roles, and it's it's, it's very difficult to do. Um, but that was my first exposure to, to to governance and compliance. And of course, banks are generally highly governed organizations, so um, it's quite rigid, um, and and you have to sort of play by the rules. And I was still young, and you sort of listened to the to to what people were telling you. Um, but that, from there, I sort of moved on into into the world of consulting, and that eventually led to us. Um, getting into the world of IT and software development, and um, that's where I got exposed to the to, to frameworks like the Rational Unified Process and the early implementations of Agile, and later to Discipline Agile Delivery and Scaled Agile Framework, and, and so it went. Um, and um, more recently, 
kind of moved back into the financial services industry where I'm now again exposed to the very same kind of conflict that you experience between let's say marketing people who want to do things and governance people who want to stop you from doing things. Um, and that's 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 been my journey with 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 compliance and, and oversight. Of course, what's what's made it interesting is that as I got older, um, I I got more difficult. You know, this like the T-shirt uh, that I saw the other day where the guy said, um, "I never thought I'd become a grumpy old man, but here I am, absolutely <laughs> nailing it." <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I kind of identified with that T-shirt simply because uh, if I think back to where I was 25 years ago and, you know, governance and rules were given to me and I kind of complied because that was the right thing to do. I'm a different person today. I don't just comply. I, I always, I'm, I'm the difficult guy. I'm the guy who says why, and I can think of a better way to do it. Um, so that, it's, it's really my uh, my world has changed a lot, and, and I've, I've learned not to accept things and 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 not just to to do things because governance and oversight people tell you to. Because um, in as much as I think governance and oversight is a is a healthy discipline and needs to be in place in many organisations, I think it's often overdone and poorly managed and uh, inappropriately done. Um, I've, I've always been of the opinion that if you want to show people how how idiotic human beings can be, you only you only have to look at two things: the way we we how absolutely stupid we become when you put forms in front of us. Um, <laughs> just go and open a bank account, you know, and the bankers will put five forms in front of you, and they all start with name, initials. And you're like, okay, why do I put my initials? I've already given you my full names. You've got my initials. Why am I filling this in again? Um, but people actually do this, you know, they, they, the, the moment you put a form in front of people, they stop thinking okay, and they become absolute idiots. Um, and it's the same with often with, with rules and frameworks. Um, it turns people into idiots and they stop questioning and they stop using the six inches between the ears. Um, and so often governance gets off the rails a bit because it tends to over govern and, um, and it becomes a problem. And that's when you have the the interesting stories that you can tell about these things. Um, and there's many of those, of course. And I think one of the one we discussed before that was interesting was the whole, um, the, the, the whale watching or the whale spotting data that was collected in South Africa for many decades for absolutely no use, no useful reason, um, which is quite an interesting story if we can maybe delve into later. But um, governance can, it's, it's a bit like interference in, 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 in economics. When you interfere into an economic system, that interference begets more interference. You interfere with something, you're breaking equilibrium. When you break equilibrium, you create areas that you now need to tend to. So you end up interfering even more, and then you break more equilibrium, and then you inter have to end up having to interfere even more. And sometimes rules tend to do that. So you often end up with situations where people keep on making more and more and more and more rules, but nobody takes a step back and says, well, how many of these rules do we still actually need? Are there some of these rules that we can get rid of? Um, because uh, maybe we don't just we just don't need them anymore. The world has changed. And, and, and I find that to be a big problem. Um, and so I quite enjoy being difficult about these things these days and just saying, why? Why? Explain to me why must I do that? Um, and by the way, I can think of a better way um, because I think there's too much uh, out there that is done for for no good reason. Well, Zian, uh, thank you for that introduction about uh, and, and I've captured a lot of notes that I want to cover with you. Um, I want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier is you said that the, there is a need for conflict that needs to exist in oversight. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, so, so let's go back to the, to the example that I used. So, you know, when I started, I was a credit manager uh, in the banking industry. Now, as, as a credit manager, obviously, you're always looking at credit and you, you're trying to make good credit decisions. Um, on the other side of the fence is, is, is a business development guy or a, or, or a branch manager or somebody who's doing marketing and trying to sell credit facilities to clients. 
And this guy is trying to make his numbers. Um, and he's trying to make his numbers by basically selling credit and selling bank facilities to clients. So the more he can sell, the better for him. Mm. Um, you as a credit manager sit on the other side of the fence and you are measured by the quality of the credit that you grant. So yes, uh, if you, you could be a very nice credit manager and grant all the credit, but if it starts going bad, it comes back on you. It doesn't go back to the marketing guy. Mm. So you always end up having this conflict between sales and marketing who say more, 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 and credit that says, no, hang on, the risk is too great. And, and there's many other examples you can use uh, in the life insurance industry, for instance. You'll have the financial advisor saying, ah, oh, man, this guy's healthy, give him a life policy. And the underwriters would say, you know what, we think he's overweight and we don't want to give him a life policy. Um, <clears throat> so you, again, that exactly that same kind of conflict between the guys who are trying to sell stuff and the guys who are trying to hold you back a bit. Um, and I, tongue-in-cheek, I've got this tongue-in-cheek uh, way of referring to, and, 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 and I've heard this used by other people as well, you know, the governance and compliance people are the, the business interruption officers. Um, <laughs> and they, they're always the people who hold everything back. But it's, and, and there's, 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 a, there's some truth in that, but it's not necessarily always a bad thing. Um, you know, it, it, it is important to, to, to sometimes practice a bit of caution, um, specifically in some cases. Um, but I do think that sometimes it gets out of hand a bit. So, so I think the, necess the necessity for that tension is, is, is a good thing, um, but it needs to be a creative kind of tension. Um, and it's creative when people can sit around the table and have a discussion. And, and that's where the thing sometimes falls apart for me. Mm. Uh, you often find that the, the governance and compliance people have the rule book. And thou shalt not question, and thou shalt not break the rules, and thou shalt be fired if you do. Um, and so they tend to have a lot of power, and they exercise that power, and sometimes to, to the detriment of the organization, although the meaning behind what they're trying to do is often well meant and well intended, it sometimes doesn't end up being that. Um, it's it, and, and and that's where I think the the creative tension to me doesn't always happen. I would like to see more creative tension um, existing. It mustn't always just be conflict. Conflict is is a good thing, but that conflict must be of a creative nature where people can sit down and talk about things and the, and and the guys who make the rules can say, okay, you can see this rule is not really very clever in this situation. You know, maybe we should just mm. not apply it here. But that doesn't happen, you know, because the rule book is the rule book and we will apply it um, regardless. And, and, and that's, I think, not, not a healthy approach. Well, I think the insight here, as Jan, from that ex example is, is that, first of all, well, there's a few insights. First of all, is that any oversight uh, function provides a valuable um function in the organization and creates a healthy tension um, between um, going going too far or uh, go, going too far. So the, the analogy here is, is that the reason why braking technology in motor vehicles are so advanced is so that cars can go faster. And it's exactly that, that same principle um, at play. So that's the first insight is, is that that, that balance uh, that that balance tension is really needed in organizations you talked about create having that creative tension uh, but the insight there is is in order to establish that creative tension is you need things like psychological safety in place etc um, and that openness to improve the rules that we've had that we've established uh, 10 years ago, the reasons for those rules doesn't exist anymore. Um, so maybe let's understand what's changed in, 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 in our situation uh, in, in that respect. And that also then puts the onus on those oversight and governance practitioners to be open to change, but change for the right reasons, not just change for the sake of changing. 
kind of that, that's my insight okay yeah tell us a bit more about that uh, well spotting data yeah it's a so 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 let me start by saying I, i'm not 100 percent sure how true this story is i heard it from somebody else but the way it was told it sounded like it was absolutely true so i'm going to just tell it anyway but apparently um <coughs> The, the, the way the story is told to me is that these guys were working for an organization that was given the job to go and do some process automation and implementing of new um, ERP systems at a municipality in the in the Western Cape in South Africa. Um, and so they arrived there, and of course, typically as consultants do, they start looking at all the processes. And how does the system be? What are the existing systems doing? And uh, you know, what do we need to replicate? And how can we improve things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things they came across is they came across this, um, this register that the guys were keeping up to date. And it was a register on which they recorded uh, uh, whale sightings. So they would record the day, um, the time of day, um, more or less the weather conditions, and roughly the GPS coordinates of where the whales were spotted. And they would record it on a register. And once, once a week, this register would be sent up from that municipality down in the Western Cape all the way to the capital city in Pretoria. Um, and that was just done. So the consultants already asked them and said, so, okay, so, so why do you guys do this? And they said, no, nah, we have absolutely no idea. The guys in Pretoria want this information. So, okay, now, of course, the good consultant gets on the phone and he phones the people in Pretoria and he says, okay, people in Pretoria, um, these guys down here in Hermanus are sending you these uh, well spotting, this well spotting data register once a week. What is it used for? Because we would like to see if we can maybe automate this process somehow and just make it a bit more efficient. So the response they got was, we have absolutely no idea why these guys send this to us. Um, these strange guys down there in Armana send us this stuff and we just put it in a file and we've already got like 20 files dating back three or four decades just sitting on the shelf and we have absolutely no idea what it's for, but it must be important because, you know, they are recording it and they're sending it us. So we just, we just keep it on the file. So this was like a major mystery. Why, why was this being done? And so when they when they investigated deeper and deeper and deeper, they eventually came, they eventually found the answer. Um, and the answer was simply this: um, back in the days, and this is now back to nineteen thirties or something. Um, I think back when South Africa was still called the Union of South Africa, and we were part of the Commonwealth. Um, the then Queen Elizabeth, who was then Princess Elizabeth was planning a trip down to South Africa. And the authorities uh, obviously wanted to make this a very positive trip because we were part of the Commonwealth and now it's the king's, the king's daughter that's coming to visit. And um, so they tried to, 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 to make this trip as memorable as possible. And they found out that she really wanted to see Wales. And so, of course, they started and they came up with this plan that says, let's record all the whale sightings and the weather conditions and more or less where the whales are spotted. And then at least we can have a much better chance of taking her to the right spot when she's here to show her some whales. And of course, she came to South Africa, they took her off to go and see the whales and she went back to England and they just continued recording the, the whale spotting data because nobody told the people who were recording the registers why they were doing it. They were just told, you must do this. And so they did it. And they continued doing it for, for many decades and filled up shelves with files up in Pretoria with these registers only because of this one visit by a royal to South Africa. And nobody said, hey, guys, we don't need this anymore. They just carried on doing it. So that's the kind of stupidity that happens when you make rules uh, and nobody knows why the rules are made and the rules, you, you know, they're just there. Um, and there's so many other examples of that in the legal fraternity you often find out of date acts. Um, I, read, I read about one the other day in the United States where you could still get a dollar or something for shooting an Indian. And that was still like a, a legitimate act on the statute books, they, nobody had repealed it. And obviously, I don't think you get away with 
shooting an Indian for a dollar. But the point is that act was still on the statute books and it was never repealed. So we do these things, you know, as humans, um, because we just don't question and we just don't ask why and can mm. we do this better? So <clears throat> that's a really fascinating story and it's got so many facets to it. So uh, I think we should change uh, uh, oversight to well watching. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one of, one of the follow up questions on that story uh, that I wanted to uh, and linking to something you said earlier is uh, being a little bit more curmudgeon as you as you uh, explained that you you're asking you, you, you're a lot a lot more um how can i put it uh asking a lot more why and this is one of the key things that i think uh, good oversight capability or um people that that do oversight in governments is they need to be able to ask why I think it's a it's a key skill that that's needed and evaluate whether it's a valid why. Um, you you also talked about um, learning not to accept things. This is this curmudgeon uh, type of uh, t-shirt that you were talking about. You um, what would you what do you think prevents people from changing things um, just blindly following? What what do you think may, may be at play there? Oh, geez, I think probably a lot of things, you know, we, we, you, the average human being likes to please the boss, you know, because that's how you get promoted and you get a nice increase at the end of the year and all that kind of stuff. So we, we always aim to please. And, you know, if, if, if your job is to make rules and get people to adhere to rules, then that's what you're going to do, you know, uh, regardless, because the better you do that, uh, the better you you'll end up uh, in the organization. So we, we, we do these things really for self-interest, I suppose. Uh, some people just aren't of the nature of, they're just not questioning type people. Some people are very rules driven and rules focused and that's okay. You know, we need people like that. It's not a bad thing. Um, it's just the way they are. Um, and so you do need you do need the, the more creative questioning people sometimes and you and you do need the people that kind of hold back and say hang on um, no, we need to think about you know, the rules say this there's a rule the reason why the rule is there so um, I don't know it's, it's it's a difficult one for me to answer I think uh, it almost comes back to that thing I said earlier and it was a bit tongue-in-cheek but um, it's amazing how you can turn people into idiots and how easy it is just by putting rules in front of people. Just make, tell people these are the rules. Um, you have to do it like this. And, and you know, that's, this, is, this is how we do things and this is how we've always done it. And because we, we can't do it any other way. The law says, okay, so show me where in the law does it actually say that. And I've just recently had a situation like that where somebody put a, came up with this form that needed to be signed by clients and it was like a six page document and I looked at it and I read through it and I couldn't find anything in it that was of any value. Um, so I said, well, why are we doing this? Is what are, uh, the law says we have to do this. I said, okay, which law? Now it's this new law about protecting uh, people's private information. I said, okay, well, I've read that law and nowhere in that law does it say we have to make people sign a six page document especially not a six-page document that spends two pages talking about the South African constitution, which is completely irrelevant to, to the topic. And, 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 and so, so it's amazing how things get out of hand very quickly if, 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 you, if you allow it. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, people become idiots when you make rules. Um, one thing that uh, Gareth uh, 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 our other uh, co-conspirator here with Navavi um, talks about is uh, a phenomenon uh, called, and pardon the French, he calls it bullshit jobs. Um, mm -hmm. And um, th this is quite an interesting phenomenon. Um, a few years ago, there was an article exactly calling that out, is that a lot of, not a lot, but there are some jobs out there that are purely mm -hmm. just fictional jobs. How much of a function of the of this bullshit jobs that you've just explained uh, plays a role in that phenomenon of what uh, of the example? 
I, th I think there's there, there is some of that. Um, I think that problem exists probably more on other sides of the organization than in, in, in than in compliance. I think compliance is generally a fairly small um, focused area. So I don't think there's too much of that BS done of jobs there, but you do find it. Um, people that are just doing the uh, tick bird and pencil pushing type stuff that, that adds really very little value there, there is that uh, but I don't think that's that's a major issue certainly not the way I've seen it I think it's mm. just it's often highly qualified people um, and and you know I mentioned this story about the, the six page form earlier designed by highly qualified people if you read that document it's highly highly structured legalese language in that document this is not it wasn't designed by stupid people it's very clever people that designed this form it's completely irrelevant of course but the point is very clever people so um what happened there? How, how did this come about? you know somebody made a law that said you have to do this and the law was misinterpreted and of course, one of the things that the law says that the directors can go to jail. And of course, then the directors jump on the compliance people and said, you better make sure that we don't go to jail. Um, and then, you know, we design a space document. Mm, it's um, fear driven. Yeah. yeah, we've done our job. If you land up in jail now, it's not our fault. Yeah, yeah, it's fear. <laughs> um, I think one of the things on the earlier question that I asked uh, about um, what drives people to into this type of behavior um, is I think also we need to look at how people are rewarded. Um, I think the reward, uh, how, how organizations reward people plays a big role in how they act uh, in, 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 in that respect. So if they get rewarded for making rules, and more rules and more rules. You talked about rules begetting rules begetting rules. It's like mm -hmm. a pond that gets disturbed. Um, then they will keep doing that. So Correct. I think uh, one thing we need to uh, work with organizations is to understand when we look at the bigger picture, the wider ecosystem, what would be the impact and then tailor the rewards uh, accordingly. Now, that's very difficult. Um, the other thing about you, you talked about following rules and the moment you put rules down, people just follow it. And that's something that's got to do with the schooling system. I suspect we've been taught from a very early age that these are the rules and you will follow these rules instead of just asking why uh, mm -hmm. and being able to open to discuss as well. So um, we see a lot of that uh uh, there's a Japanese saying, if you're the nail that stands out, the hammer, you will get the hammer on your head. So, so yeah. asking why is not a safe uh, practice in, in a schooling system because you're going to wear the, bear the consequences with that. Um, mm -hmm. So very, very interesting. Uh, I want to jump into uh, something very similar to what we've just discussed. Now, thinking back a few years, uh, Zion, uh, when I worked uh, for you, you were my direct manager, but also the managing director of the company. And one thing that was pretty obvious um, is that you, when I asked you, who's the HR person that I need to deal with in order to get all of these things, you said to me that we don't have an HR um, capability, we don't have an HR person uh, in the organization. And this is probably going to put a few people off. Uh, but what was you, you ran a really successful business and you still did not see the, the need for an HR person in the organization. What was the, 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 the reasons for that? Um, well, I think, first of all, I, I don't think we were ever really that large that we could really justify that. But I think um, I was always, always also very privileged um, in that business. Um, you know, that is probably the time in my life when I had to had to practice as a person, some form of oversight. 
and it was it was it was very fortuitous for me that the practicing of that oversight was incredibly lightweight. And the reason for that is that I worked with incredibly skilled people, people like yourselves and Horia and Gareth, you knew all of them, um, all with a particular passion for what they did. Um, and so there was no real need to, to, to over govern these people. You know, you, you kind of needed to just point them in a direction. Um, it's like, you know, it's almost like throwing a, a, a ball for a dog, you know, you just needed to sort of throw the ball and the dog would run. And, 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 and that's, that, that was really a privilege working with a team like that. So I never really needed to overmanage. And it was, even if, I think we were, if, if, we, if we ever got that business to be even five times the size that it was, um, I still probably wouldn't have had an HR person because it, it simply wasn't necessary. You know, you were working with highly motivated, highly passionate, highly skilled people. So it, it was a privilege to work with such people and um, not, not just a privilege from the perspective of it's really nice working with such people, but because it just makes it so easy to manage. Um, you, you didn't actually have to manage a lot. You could kind of just point people in the direction and say, go and make it happen and they would do that. It was wonderful. So very lightweight over, oversight. Um, it doesn't always work in every kind of business, of course. Mm. So you can't always do that. There's some businesses where you, you, know, you kind of need to, to apply a bit of different management skills. But um, that was a great pleasure for me. So that's, I think, why we, we, never had a, we, we never had an HR discipline in the business. It just mm. wasn't necessary. I'm noticing that uh, in in general, um, there are some good things that HR capabilities and organizations can do, but many times in in organizations, the HR capability um, has got too many rules, and we we sit in a skill scarcity situation. Is that come organizations compete against others for skills? and for people that can do the work. And many times we notice that the HR capability or function are the actual real blocker to getting people hired um, so that the organization can grow and, and do whatever it is that they do. What do you yeah. think um, can organizations in, in that situation can do um, in order to, to get quicker access? As well as from an oversight perspective, obviously, what can oversight do in order to uh, roll that obstacle out of the way? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question. Um, how do you roll that obstacle out of the way? Well, you know, if if uh, I suppose you know if, if there's an obstacle in the way, ask the question: What is the obstacle, and why is it there? Um, and if HR is the obstacle, ask. The question, so why is HR the obstacle and, and, and what are they doing that's, that's causing the, the obstacle to exist? Um, yeah, they are supposed to be the people who facilitate the acquisition of skills, not stopping the acquisition of skills. Um, but then I think sometimes, again, it comes down to rules. Um, I've seen so many cases where organizations have these recruitment processes that are just diabolical, you know, 15 interviews and a case study and a this and a that and a, uh, a presentation and then a, a, a panel interview by the board members and, and you think to yourself, honestly, is that really necessary? Um, it, it, does, it, does it take that many people to make a decision on whether you, you need to hire somebody? Um, I think not. Um, I mean, if I could, I could have run Indigo Cube, and most of the people that we appointed were were typically appointed with two interviews. Um, I always did the first interview, which was kind of going against the grain. You know, you typically find that first interviews are always done by more junior people or um, uh, peers. Um, and then it goes up to the boss who makes the final decision. I tended to do it the other way around. I just said, no, I want to talk to the person first. Um, if I like the person, um, I would sometimes refer it to 
to another colleague, but not even always. Um, there were there were times where I literally, um, in a in in an interview, literally in an interview, offered a person a job. Um, and that was because I could see that the person had what I was looking for. Um, and it was a very simple approach I followed. I always said, I hire people that are smarter than me. Um, I always really tried to hire people that, are, that I felt are more capable intellectually than I am. Um, and uh, that, that, that that to me has stood me, it, it worked for me. It, 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 I always had a, a very strong team around me um, because I had really clever people working for me. Um, and I looked for people that had passion. Um, I, I did not want to hire people that I needed to change their nappies and wipe their noses. Um, I wanted people that I could point in a direction. <laughs> So, okay, I'm going to throw you a ball and you're going to go and fetch it, you know, uh, go off and run. Because we, we often did projects where um, one or two consultants, which we, we, we throw them in the deep end. And although you you experienced one of those projects, uh, we, we threw you in the deep end on, on a project and said, okay, you've got arms, you can swim, I'm sure you'll cope. And you did. And you actually did a fantastic job. Um, and, and I think that particular job to some extent changed your career. But um, that, that's the kind of stuff we did. You know, we, we hired good people and we trusted them um, to do a good job. And, and most of the times they did. Uh, sadly, not always, the, there was always the exception here and there, but uh, generally uh, it worked out well. That specific, that specific customer, uh, I remember I was quite uh, upset about a program manager trying to strong on me out of, um, out of something and uh i got um i got escalated to the to the senior manager and when i spoke to zian about it um he started laughing and he he asked me have you never been escalated before have you never <laughs> been in trouble before and that just opened up for, uh, for me that i knew that <laughs> you had my back um so even though you were applying an oversight capability <clears throat> you still had my back in terms of uh, that situation so um i was i was genuinely thinking is that oh god i'm going to be fired because i've upset this customer and in many cases we do see that type of behavior is a consultant gets fired because they've upset a customer but when you get a consultant in you intend to change something so the consultant mm -hmm. is the change agent or the the, uh, but many times they get crucified for bringing the change. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, because also, you know, again, you, you've always got the two sides in the organization. Again, going back to the whole balance with oversight, you've got the guys who made the rules and they are there, come hell or high water to protect their rules. And you come along and you want to break down the rules because <laughs> you know, they don't work. And so they don't like you. <laughs> mm. It is. It's 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 hard, you know. Um, some people don't like when you come and upset their little empires. Yeah, Oria, you came off mute. You wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I was just reflecting on the importance of careful contribution from the people and capability community. I prefer people and capability to human resources. I find. Um, referring to humans as resources is being intensely disrespectful. Um, in yeah, my personal experience, humans are not sprockets. <laughs> We're yeah. not fungible. We're not uh, um, uh, replaceable. It's very much of a, of a mechanistic view of, um, of human communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very harmful. So just as sometimes people and capability may appear like an obstacle because what do they do they are charged with achieving a safe <coughs> um, hiring process therefore mm -hmm. they want to make sure that we're not attracting bad apples that the people that we're um, securing are, are really good and they're a good fit to the organization and unfortunately too often we don't notice that this very search for a fit is part of the problem in itself 
Because equally mm -hmm. so, then we have the situation of, oh, we don't like that person. Their questions are making us uncomfortable. Let's get rid of them. <laughs> when with a bit of curiosity we might find out and hold on a second what's this person doing and why uh why are they behaving the way that they're do uh, that they're doing why are they asking those questions that are painful uncomfortable and so on and rather than jumping in to criticize them and attack them or denigrate them or um in other words kind of destroy them economically in some way why don't we pay attention because where the pain is, that's where value can come from. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, something you just said made me think, you know, sometimes people, well, I suppose we've all had this experience. Somebody some, sometimes asks you a, a question, a difficult question, and, and you sit there and you think, I don't know the answer to this, but maybe I should know the answer. And in, as an intellectual person, you feel like a, you feel a little, um, oh, okay, I've been caught out. <laughs> you know, I don't know the answer to this. And, and the reality is actually that those are good moments. Um, uh, those are the kind of moments that make you really reflect on difficult things and, 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 and go and look for answers. Um, the, the initial experience might be, oh, I've been caught out. Um, that's not a bad thing. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know, but I can find out. Um, and, and, and that's the, that's the, that, that's always a good thing. It's a good experience to have, uh, but we tend to shy away from it. We, oh, we need to have all the answers, you know. That's why we have to, that's why we chose the word oversight because it's got two meanings. It's also, it's an oversight. We forgot about this or we didn't know about this. That's the reason why we chose oversight. Yeah. So yeah. that's exactly that mechanism of uh, that tension between what did we miss? What do we need to do uh, in order not to repeat this disaster? And yeah. how are we overseeing things? So that's, yeah. that's exactly what the intent is. And it's a great example. Thank it you. It doesn't even have to be a disaster. It can be just a better opportunity. Yeah, because too often keeping things as they are doesn't appear like a disaster right now, but what it does is it prevents us from better. Yes, and 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 more more philosophically, um, if you if you if you buy into the idea that the world has become a more complex place and there's some interesting debates about that topic but um, if you buy into that idea that the world is becoming more complex um, then you also have to accept the fact that the rules we made for years gone by are probably not going to apply anymore and we need to keep on rethinking these things um, uh, there was a very interesting thing that Aldo shared yesterday on LinkedIn um, it's a comment by Jordan Peterson. He's a quite a controversial guy. Um, he's the kind of guy that gives some people's backs up, and he, um, you, 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 you sometimes agree with him, and sometimes you just don't. Um, but he's a he's a very interesting intellectual person. But he made a very good statement, in, in, and he was talking about um, how ideologies become a substitute for for knowledge and and, and, that, and that that was a bad thing because uh when an ideology becomes a substitute for knowledge you sit you end up with a situation where uh, a kind of a i know it all approach um prevails in a world where you have complexity and and that never works the, the, the two just seldom go together and when i when i read his comment um i i, I kind of looked at it and i said you know what i can replace there was a, like a paragraph, and I thought there's three words in that paragraph I could change. Um, I could change ideology to to frameworks or, or rule systems <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, and I could change um, uh, 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 knowledge to decision making, and I could change uh, complex society or wh whatever the last term in the paragraph was to the complexity in business, and I could change the paragraph to read. You know, when we when we use frameworks to 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 substitute good for for, for decision making, you end up with a very bad situation because um, that kind of know it all, one size fits all, cookie cutter approach 
it's just never going to work in a in in a, in a complex world, and 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 they seldom do. Um, so, you know, the the world changes, um, and it's it's foolish to think that the rules and the the governance structures that we built for for years gone by uh, are still relevant for for a world of today. And and I'll, I'll use a very simple example. So many years ago, when I started in banking, it was very simple to approve a, a, a mortgage loan in South Africa. We had basically two rules. Um, the mortgage loan wasn't allowed to be more than 90% of the value of the property. That was the first one. And the second one was that the, 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 the mortgage loan installment wasn't allowed to be more than 30% of the joint family income. Um, and it was a pretty good process. That's how we approved mortgage loans. Very simple. Um, of course, it worked because in those days, inflation in South Africa was running at about 25%. So um, two things would happen. Um, you bought a house for 100,000 Rand, and a year later, the house would be worth probably 125,000 Rand. So the risk of your 90% loan was significantly lower 12 months later compared to 12 months before. Also, your salary would probably go up by 25% per annum. And so the, the affordability challenge that you may have had a year ago is significantly lower a year later, simply because of inflation. And so that system worked. Um, you wind the clock forward 25 years, and South Africa is in a situation where inflation is at 5 6%. And suddenly, you can't give people home loans with re with the repayment ratios of 30% of joint family income, because a year later, that affordability challenge is still going to be there. And it's probably going to be there three years later, and four years later, and five years later, because inflation isn't eroding it. So they had to come up with a different way. And they did. The banks don't approve loans like that anymore. They do it differently. So they adapted. They had to. Um, and, and that's a good example of how the rules that were used in times gone by just became irrelevant and inappropriate and were replaced with better rules. Um, and, and, and that's a good thing. And, and we need to do that continuously. We have to. Uh, the world doesn't allow us to, uh, if, if you keep on following the same old rules, it becomes like an anchor. It, it, it anchors you into the past and it doesn't allow you to move forward. Um, and the same thing happens with any kind of framework for that matter. The framework is a very static concept and some of the framework guys would try and crucify me for saying that and tell me that their frameworks are very adaptable, and, but that's rubbish. I've never seen people implement those frameworks with any kind of flexibility. The, those frameworks very quickly become like forms, you know, you fill it in. Mm -hmm. Dick box. This is the way it works. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you don't really generally see a lot of flexibility around those things. So they become, they become rule-based systems that are implemented and people adhere to them. Um, and they may be appropriate at the time, but two or three years later, they're probably not appropriate any longer. You said earlier in the conversation that people stop thinking when you put a form in them and then you alluded to putting a framework in front of them. And that's very much what we do see with some of the frameworks out there uh, as well. And it's quite frustrating uh, organizations getting you in to come and help them implement that framework. And then you notice the decision was taken six months ago, but the conditions has changed. You chose the wrong framework. It's not going to work anymore. Um, uh, it, it's quite fascinating to, to look at that dynamic uh, as well. Yeah. So I had the privilege many years ago of talking to a, a particular CIO in one of the very large um, financial services organizations here in South Africa. And at the time, I was a bit of a framework kind of a junkie. Um, and we were talking very much about um, Scrum and Disciplined Agile. And you know, you need to do these things because that's how you do good software development. And um, it's very much like uh, using this framework in, in your services side and that framework. And then you need to do it with your software, software development as well. And then we kind of sat there and a wise old guy and he's kind of listened to us and he said, you know what, we use all of these frameworks. Um, and then we put them back on the shelf and we leave them there for a couple of months. And <laughs> then we go and take them off the shelf again and we just have a look at them again and say, okay, uh, is there something we can do here, something we can learn? 
something we can use to make things better. And if we if there is, we do it, and then we put them back on the shelf. Mm. And and I and I was like, ah, th this guy's not getting it. But actually, he was getting it. Um, he was right. His approach was correct. Um, you need you you shouldn't be uh, held hostage by these things um, and and governed too much by them. You should use them as guiding guidelines, and, and and that's what they're there to do. They they add value when you when you use them like that. Is when you start making them rules that have to be complied with, and then I think you're on the wrong track. Uh, I think many years ago it was in fact, I think it was Ivar Jakobsen who made the joke. Uh, he was talking about methodologies in the day. Um, and, he, and he actually said, "What's the difference between?" Uh, a terrorist and a, and a methodology and, and 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 the answer was well at least you can negotiate with a terrorist <laughs> so, and i thought that was quite clever and that's exactly what you see in business you know these these frameworks and these rule systems uh, they become so pervasive and and so thou shalt not question that uh, you just can't negotiate you know if you if you don't fit in and don't do the job as it's as you're told to do it, you get fired, which is really stupid. Yeah, there are two things that I would like to to draw our attention to. So, you may be familiar with Ian McGilchrist's work on the master and his emissary. Uh, he makes a really interesting case that uh, our current society is gripped by primarily left brain concerns of focusing on the detail of grasping specific items it's very much i have this framework i must employ the framework uh, i will just do what i'm told do 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 mm. do as opposed to right brain concern consider the big picture understand the context uh, notice nuance in the context and adapt your way of engaging with the world accordingly right so um in the general world out there, many of us are what you might call implementationists, right? Left brain thinkers, we're focusing on just tell me what to do. And I'll, I'll do the thing, give me a recipe, I'll follow the recipe. I'm not inventing new recipes, right? I'm just following the recipe because, hey, that's how you make a cake, that's how you make a tea, and so on and so forth. You follow the, yeah. the routine. Yeah. And yet, from time to time, we need abstractionists, right? Right brain thinkers that go, hold on a second, there could be better, there could be a different way. And this kind of um, imbalance is what you see in um, methodologists, basically, virtually all methodologists are by necessity abstractionists, because they have to mm -hmm. abstract away from here's how work is actually getting done <clears throat> to what are the classes of activities that are happening then sequence them and say okay if this then that and you end up then with a straitjacket of here's what the recipe is right yeah so um for my sins i've served as a methodologist and i've done my best to uh, to articulate flexible and adaptable frameworks but as uh you were noticing every single time people take off the shelf a particular framework, they will be <laughs> temp tempted to implement it uh, lock, stock, and barrel. Mm. Everything in the kitchen sink. <clears throat> and no matter how you say you can throw this away and you can throw that away and you can throw this other thing away, nobody wants to let go of stuff because psychologically we're conditioned against loss. I don't want to lose stuff because it might be valuable. You know, we're, we're uh, very much hoarders of, of guidance, right? And if it might give us a, a sliver of value, I want to keep it. And that then blows things out of proportion and it makes things more complicated than they need to be. And we forget that, do we have to have Scrum, really? Is Scrum really necessary in all contexts? Well, ah, it gets really, really <laughs> tough. Yeah, because yeah. you could say, well, it depends. No, 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 it doesn't depend. You must have Scrum all the time. Well, hold on a second. Well, what are you trying to solve for? And why do I have to wait a week? If, even if my, my scrum duration is a week, why can't I not learn today? Because I've just noticed something. And do I have to wear that sort of hole in my shoe for the rest of the week rather than patch it right now? No, I don't have to. So if need be, I can adjust and adapt um, instantly. Now, 
this is what's lost oftentimes this um nuance that's necessary now the difficulty with this is we don't cultivate enough empathy for the people that resort to the use of frameworks and methodologies because think of it if we put ourselves in their shoes right so that's the second um aspect uh it's undeniable that some frameworks are tremendously um successful if by successful we mean um popular right hmm. uh, i want to use um scale ledger framework i want to use scrum i want to use um pick a, a favorite uh, approach and like uh, yeah, yeah, idle is perfectly fine, uh, just as well, or um, the various, you know, um, COBIT and uh, yeah. other um, things like that. Makes perfect sense, yeah? But why do we do that? We do that because we want to have some confidence, some comfort, some certainty that we're not crazy, we're not alone, kind of going off the reservation, so to speak. We have some safety in numbers to say, well, uh, I did what most everybody else recommends as the good thing to do, as opposed to, look at that idiot. He went where? He did what? How dare he think for himself and mm -hmm. move in a completely weird direction? Oh, if it pays off, everybody kind of applauds them. It's like, whoa, revolutionary thinker leads the organization to new heights. But too often we're scared. Because, hey, our organization is reasonably okay. It's not on the front page uh, in, in news as a, kind of a catastrophe of some sort. So therefore, we don't want to be in, in trouble. We want to be safe. So to be safe, what do we do? We use the framework, the this, the that, and then we're safe because, hey, we're with the rest of the pack. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting uh, that safety. But what is insufficient because I'm not here to, to criticize people for using frameworks. But what are they going to do? Use nothing? They're going to have to use something. Um, yeah. So the question is, how do we make it so that we appreciate the value of discomfort? Of, of noticing, ah, eh, you know what? It doesn't quite fit. Let's, let's agree that it's okay to tweak and let's find out how to tweak better. And I don't think we've, we've figured this one out sufficiently well because too often we have this, first we drink the Kool-Aid and we're like, yay, frameworks are awesome. And then we get disillusioned with frameworks and we become kind of almost in the other um, yeah. extreme. It's like, ah, oh, frameworks are evil. Yeah, uh, I, I have good friends in the community that hate some frameworks with a passion. It's like, look at the catastrophe that is created in organization after organization. How could you have anything but the utmost disregard and disdain for this such and such a, a, a framework? So <clears throat> the point isn't so much um, which on the spectrum you want to be in. Uh, I think the challenge is how do we balance? How do we so to say, okay, yeah. well, now let's behave more like adults. And now what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do we embrace with, with compassion, with kindness, uh, multiple perspectives and find um, a genuine way forward? Yeah. No, I think, I, think um, I actually believe that we're on the cusp of coming up with, with, with a new way of managing businesses. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that for, I'll, I'll give you a couple of ideas or, or, or point to some things that, that make me think that. Um, now I remember probably about 10 odd years ago, uh, we invited Scott Ambler over to South Africa to come and give a talk. And, and, and I remember that so vividly that at the end of Scott's talk, somebody stood up and asked Scott this question. He said, Scott, so what comes after Agile? And Scott said, I don't know, um, but I think there's probably room for one more paradigm shift in my lifetime. I just don't know what it is yet. I think we're starting to get very close to that paradigm shift. Um, and I think that we are probably going to, I, I think it's going to, there's going to be aspects of the following in that. I think the one is that there's going to be a lot more of a scientific approach to how we solve problems. Um, I think the 
the approach of using recipes um, is going to start falling out of favor and we're going to move on to a much more uh, intellectually problem-solving approach, uh, much more of a scientific <clears throat> thinking approach. Uh, I believe that. Um, and it's, it's a bit like these cooking shows, you know, you see uh, very interesting how they they have these cooking contests and they, they give people ingredients and they say, go and cook something. Now, now a good, a good uh, chef can take a bunch of ingredients and come up with a good idea and, and, and bake something that or make something that is really memorable uh, when, when you give them some ingredients because they know how these things fit together and they know how to put the different tastes and the different flavors together and what to do with it. Uh, a typical cook doesn't know how to do that. You know, the cook needs a recipe. I think we're moving from cooks to chefs. Um, so I think that's the that's the one trend that I'm seeing. I think the other thing that we're going to see is there's going to be a much bigger role played in businesses in future by leadership. And, and by leadership, I don't mean people. I mean by the discipline of leadership. I think that the, the discipline of leadership has been significantly neglected. Uh, by most businesses. Um, and I say that because all you have to do is hop onto LinkedIn and just scroll down your LinkedIn feed. And I'm prepared to bet money that without going too far down your LinkedIn feed, you're going to come up with at least one or two posts that are directly or indirectly referring to some form of toxic culture. Um, why do these toxic cultures exist? They exist because of poor leadership. Um, the, the, the problem is that the leadership of days gone by um, where the boss told you what to do and said, gather around people, let me explain to you what we're going to do. Um, those days are over. It doesn't work like that anymore. Um, businesses are, are far more challenging. They're far more complex. Um, and, and that approach just has fallen out of favor and has become completely irrelevant. The problem that I see, though, is that the discipline of leadership hasn't, hasn't quite stepped up to the plate yet. Um, it's not addressing that problem entirely. Um, not, not so much because the, the, the knowledge isn't there. I think the knowledge is there. You go and look at some of the books that have been published by the likes of Mark A and, and, and um, the guy who wrote Teams of Teams, uh, McAllister, I think is, uh, um, and some of the stuff that Simon Sinek writes. Um, certainly the knowledge is there. But it's not really being applied. And I think that uh, that's where the challenge is going to come. Leadership is going to have to play a much bigger role in the future organization, which is going to be a lot more malleable, a lot more dynamic, a lot more in, in a state of continuous flux. Um, and, and, and I'm not seeing that really being applied well yet. Um, and I think the opportunity there is that there's, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity to actually train good leadership. And by that, I don't mean, um, sorry, you want to say something? Okay, f finish your sentence and then okay. I'll ask. No, so by, by training good leadership, I don't mean the kind of leadership training that we're seeing in organizations today, because what I see is very superficial. It's very juvenile at best. It's let's go off site and play some games and do a Lego game and stuff like that. And I think to myself, my word, is that how you treat your, is that really how you train your leaders? Um, and, the, and, and that's a problem. You know, most leaders are not adequately trained. They, they promoted and promoted and promoted. And you kind of expect that in their journey through the organization, as they grow up into the organization, they naturally will acquire leadership skills. And of course they don't. They learn the stuff that they've learned from they boss, and that's the worst place to learn. Um, so uh, there's 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 massive opportunity. So I think in a world going forward, you're going to find more pliable, malleable, state of flux type organizations. You're going to find ways of work being managed in a way that is more appropriate. The oversight is going to have to adapt to that way of working. <clears throat> Your leadership definitely have to play a much much bigger role than the traditional okay let's gather around and let me tell you what we're going to do guys uh, kind of approach it's those days are over i was going to go but we've trained our people we've 
uh, hired the, one of the big five consultancies to come and do our leadership training. We are now all leaders. Um, that's what the comment that I was going to make. But want to move on uh, from there and, 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 and what you've just said as well is that the, um, the, the, the stuff that you're talking about uh, and explain, isn't that a teal type organization that, from the La, La Luz models? Yes, uh, I, I think you. Uh, I think from a from the perspective of I think what Lalu was writing about. Yes, uh, but I think there's more to it than that. I think it's really we are going to look at organisations that um, they're going to be very differently structured. There's going to be a, probably a lot less structure. Um, they're going to be more fluid. Uh, people are going to have to interact across boundaries where previously they didn't um, and your leadership model is going to be completely different mm. um, and there's there's there, there's going to become a need for training leaders the, 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 let's go off site and play a little do some team building and play a lego game <laughs> not going to cut it anymore you're going to have to do proper real deep intellectual thinking leadership training um, that really teaches people well. And it's not going to be a short little let's go on a three-day course kind of stuff either. It's going to be a lot more intensive than that. Um, if you think that you can train people leadership stuff in a three-day course, I have really bad news for you. You are going to fail and fail dismally. Um, it's, it's, it's just too complex. Azian, you're going to be egged. Your, your house is going to be egged tonight, so watch out. <laughs> um. Well, I noticed something. Um, you, you know, you, I've told you before, I'm the guy that calls the spade a shovel with a capital F. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Now, I noticed something uh, really unusual um, a while back. Uh, you were mentioning uh, Stanley McChrystal's team of teams. Yep. And I mentioned that uh, in a client meeting. And I was completely astonished uh, to get... Uh, such a virulent attack uh, from, from a person um, in that room, um, essentially attacking the personality of Stanley McChrystal, as opposed to addressing at all the content and the, the subject matter of, of Team of Teams, right? Yeah. So uh, there, there's such a, a tendency to discredit the individual rather than addressing the, the teachings, the learning. And you find this all over the place. Yeah? So people will find all sorts of excuses to maintain their um, areas of comfort, shall we say. They'll say things like, oh, I don't like what David Marquet has to say. What does he know about our uh, social service um, activities? He was in the military. It's got nothing to do with us. Completely different setting. He knows nothing. It's like, okay, right. So what you're saying is the environment of how people collaborate and um, achieve things in situations of intense uh, tension is completely different. This is not humans anymore. It's something else that's happening in this setting. It's like, oh, so um, what we see here is more a matter of we're, we're constrained in a particular fashion. There's something in our spirit that feels we're not really living up to our potential. And because we have this cognitive dissonance, we're in pain. We're struggling. And we want to avoid that pain. And how do we avoid that pain? Well, we pretend that that thing that we know we ought to be actually embracing and studying more about and learning more about and practicing more that's painful because it takes us out of comfort it goes gets us from where we think we're comfortable because hey look at me i'm a chief of such and such i'm the head of such and such mm -hmm. um it, my uh, experience and, and tradition has gotten me all this glorious success why should i need to change oh yeah but there's something in my heart that knows that i should be changing but i'm scared and i'm not humble enough to say you know what there can be better and I'm going to look yeah. into better. So a, a, a fabulous um, challenge that we have is how do we make it safe for people to practice courage? Because it's not about making it safe. Yes, we can make environment safe all we want, but 
as safe as it is, if you're not courageous enough, you're still not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I, I fully agree with you. I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of truth in what you've said there, but it's amazing how, uh, and, and I think part of the problem also lies, you know, there were, there were times, and, and they're not that long ago, when you could actually start a career in an organization and spend a lifetime working for that organization. And as you became more and more senior, your experience became more and more valuable. And it was really good to have you at a senior level uh, applying your stuff and, and guiding the organization because not, not much changed. But when, when you speed up change a bit, you quickly find out that what you did 10 years ago is no longer relevant. I mean, I, I think back at where my career in consulting started, we were doing the rational unified process. I, I don't think you can go out there and sell the rational unified process to anybody any longer these days. I think you might end up being laughed off the face of the planet. People say, who are you? What, where do you come from? Um, and, and it's completely changed, you know? And, uh, you know, then... You, you, you come to realize very quickly that things really do change a lot quicker. And the experience that we had from 20 years ago, we have to unlearn. Uh, we have to learn new things. Um, and it's difficult for us to say we have to unlearn and let go because, you know, the tradition was always that that's my experience. Mm. Um, and so I think... We have to learn, one of the things I think we as humans have to learn is that experience needs to be less um, about the content and more about the process. Uh, value the experience that allows you to make changes and adjust and adapt and, and do those kind of things, but don't value the experience that's based in static stuff. Um, this is how we do this. Okay, well, that's maybe how you did it five years ago, but now we do it differently. So mm. that's okay. We've got, we found a better way. Hey, that's not a bad thing. Um, but we, well, I think you find a lot of organizations still struggle with that. Um, people struggle with that. You know, my experience is valuable. Um, well, if your experience is valuable, then what is it? Um, and how can we use it today? But if your experience is based on stuff that we did 10 years ago and no longer do, then your experience is worth nothing. Sorry. Uh, mm. Bad news. And it's not worth that is so painful. I mean, Seth Godin <clears throat> yeah. has a wonderful book called The Practice. And yeah. uh, it's talking about how do you ship creative work well? And he makes the point that you have to do the work. You have to get the reps in. You have to yeah. read and read and read and read. So if you want to challenge what the current thinking is you need to know what the current thinking is as opposed to just rely on my thinking of 10 years ago and that's the fundamental challenge you need to keep up to speed with what's the best thinking today and understand yeah. how is it right and how is it wrong because the best thinking of today isn't right everywhere there mm -hmm. are all sorts of mistakes in thinking that we're still making nothing is perfect we never get it right completely yeah mm -hmm. so figuring out how do we contribute to the dialogue to the testing to the validating of what is really effective and what isn't and to do that we need to be aware of and well informed of what's actually going on and that takes time that takes effort and a lot of people say how are you doing oh busy and that <laughs> essentially means i'm so busy that i don't have time to keep up to speed to learn to grow to so i'm too busy yeah yeah, yeah. No, look, I think that it's interesting just to come back to the topic of oversight. So, you know, if you look at how most oversight functions are structured, they are structured exactly in a very old fashioned way. Rules, static stuff, apply this, do this, uh, don't break the rules, uh, do it the way we always did it. And if you start challenging those people with, okay, well, the world's going to change. It's going to be very flexible and we're going to do things differently one day and we're going to do it in another way in, this, in, in the day after that. How are you going to govern that? Uh, and then you see the eyes sort of glaze over. You know, we, we don't know. They don't. Um, I don't know myself. What I do know is that we probably need to start focusing from an oversight perspective more on what are the real outcomes that we want and stop focusing so much on the processes and the rules 
um, and, and, and say, yeah, okay, you know, if this is the outcome we want, maybe there are five or six different ways that we can achieve that and any one of them is good enough, you know? So why would we make a rule that says there's only one way? Um, so again, it becomes a world where we are going to have to learn to use the six inches between the ears um, and stop being idiots with forms. Um, I think that's that's where we're probably going to end up going. Um, certainly, I hope so, um, because I, I would like to live in that kind of a life or that kind of a world. Um, but uh, we are not certainly aren't there yet. I would like to offer a, a challenge there. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, kept advi you keep advising us to use more reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, let's use our minds a little bit better. Um, and what I'm noticing is too often we're using our minds reasonably okay, but what we're not using well enough is our empathy. We're forgetting mm -hmm. how to feel with people as well. Because yep. um, too often we make mistakes like, oh, value means money. Value means profit. And we forget that, well, yes, value is um, profit in many settings, but it's not just that. And when value means profit makes it so that a lot of people suffer, oh, hold on, no, 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 no. 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 And that's where, where we start to have, oh, the environment is suffering, uh-oh. Uh, oh, their social uh, unrest, uh-oh. Oh, governance is unethical and corrupt, uh-oh. Yeah. So mm -hmm. ESG finally starts to get some, some notice. But again, then you have people that kind of take it overboard and misuse it for nefarious uh, intentions. And therefore you get reactions of, oh no, all this ESG thing is um, yeah. attack, attack, attack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Losing the intention of hold on a second. It's not just the again left brain right brain uh, kind of thing. It's not just mm -hmm. uh, think better. It's also balance it with feel better as well. Because ultimately, what's an excellent life? An excellent life isn't one of I have enormous amount of wealth on an isolated island in a tropical setting and I'm just living from cocktail to cocktail day by day. No, that's not an excellent life. It's a very boring, it's, it's almost a form of hell, right? Um, of, yeah. of not having connection, not being of service to anybody. It's, it's not okay. So <clears throat> if we think of an excellent life as one of genuine enjoyment in um, human connection, in, in social uh, bonding and interaction, then feeling with people ought to be really well regarded as well. And yet, on the other hand, we have the cult of the individual. Oh, Mary, you are fantastic. You are the bestest. Oh, therefore you will be the vice president of such and such. It's like, okay. So we forget that, uh, what's great leadership. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, but I think for me, and maybe agree or don't agree, um, the, 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 the concept of feeling with people, to me, is also very much an intellectual thing. Uh, and I think that that's what I would like to see, that businesses are managed more intellectually. Um, whereas currently they are managed with frameworks and rules and forms and policies um, and not with intellect. Um, and I think intellect for me includes emotion and includes feeling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you, you, you're not going to go and think about something and say, well, this is the best solution, but we don't care how people feel about it. That, that, then you haven't thought about it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, for me, that's, that's, that's quite important. But I, I really do think that, um, and, and it will be different for different types of businesses. You know, we are generalizing, yeah, and it's always dangerous to generalize. Um, but I think uh, I've, I foresee a world where, first of all, leadership is going to play a much bigger role. I see a world where we are going to manage our organizations with a lot more of a thinking process or a scientific problem-solving processes, as opposed to rules and forms and policies. Um, and I look forward to those days, to that day. I won't have to ask why so much. <laughs> 
they will be otherwise to ask Zian. I, pro I promise you that uh, it's in our human nature. I want to just uh, uh, clo close off with, with uh, an observation about what you guys have just discussed. And as a practical implementation of, of I don't know, staging this world or getting to this world that you were talking about is when organizations looks at hiring. 50 years ago, when organizations hired people, they looked at people that collected job titles over their career. And the more job titles you had or the longer you've had those job titles for with different organizations, the more uh, valuable or the more preferred candidate you've become. This new world that you're talking about is more of a focus on hiring for capability instead yes. of how many titles have you collected through your lifetime? It's now what capabilities and skills do you have that we could utilize? Not yeah. Perhaps not all of it immediately, but in the future as well. So yeah. now that changes the dynamic of the conversation. You talked about empathy. You talked about being able to do critical thinking. Those are capabilities. And can you show us how you have applied it? Yeah. That's where so the, that, that's the world you're describing. Yes. So the traditional CV is a framework. <laughs> you think about it. Yes. <laughs> it is. It's a framework. Um, and, and there are people that will charge you money to 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 put together a really beautiful CV that looks cool and it's got all the right stuff in it and it really does all the things it pushes all the buttons but it's a framework it's a static concept um, and it's exactly as you point out most of the things that we're going to need 10 20 years from now running the modern businesses of the future they don't exist in the CVs that you see today they're not they're not written down. And and if you look at how education is changing out there to our kids in, in schools, they're moving from a framework approach to you must know all of these things and resus uh, uh, you know regurgitate it in a in a in a test to project based self-directed type learning that, that yes. kids need to actually come yes. up with an idea, go and prototype it go and do your learning, your background learning, and look at it holistically. Now, I don't think industry is ready for that type of thinking that some schools or some schooling systems are implementing in children. We want people to be creatives, but we bring them into the organization, and the moment they show any, any bit of creativity, then they they get knocked, uh, you know, the, the, the nail that stands, stands out, the tall poppy, yeah. whatever it is. Then you've got cancel yeah. culture and all of these things suddenly stepping in. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm putting out a challenge here to industry. What are you doing to prepare for the new workforce that's being trained or taught to work and think in a different way? Yeah, so here's an interesting one for you. Probably about seven, eight years ago, I had the opportunity to visit one of the South African universities and they were running a very interesting program for in their computer science department. And although, as you know, we, we tended to favor appointing computer science graduates. Um, <clears throat> any, anyway, I went to this university and <clears throat> uh, I spoke to the, the, the dean of the faculty and, and I said to him, so what subjects do you do you teach your students? And he said, we don't. And I was like, okay, this, this is going to be an interesting discussion. Um, <clears throat> he said, no, in the first year in, in their computer science degree, we give them a system. We give them a spec and it's a pretty basic spec. It's a basic little banking system that they have to write. Um, and these guys are put into little agile teams and they have to apply the principles of Scrum. So we teach them a bit about Scrum and we teach them a bit about programming and programming disciplines, etc. And they have to write the system. They have to develop the system. And at the end of the year, they have to come and present the system to us, show us how it works and uh, show us how they tested it and show us that it is actually a functioning system. And if they, they manage to do that, we, we let them pass and they go to their second year. I said, wow. That's interesting. I said, what do you do in the second year? I said, well, we asked them to take the same system and, 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 and build upon it. 
So now we give them some non-functional requirements because in their first year, they didn't do any non-functional requirements. They only built some basic functions. So we give them some more functions to build. We give them some non-functional requirements and then we teach them about things. And now they have to build a more mature banking system for us. Um, and then they have to come and demonstrate these things and demonstrate that the system is actually secure and that it can perform and, and all these kind of things. And if they do that correctly, we let them pass and go to their third year. And I say, okay, let me guess. And what, what do they do in their third year? Do they continue with the system? He said, yes, absolutely, they do. In fact, they did that for four years. Um, and at the end of the fourth year, um, they, they ended up really building pretty robust uh, banking systems, which they then had to go and demonstrate to, to the banking industry. Um, now, you think to yourself, wow, I would love to have these graduates because these guys have just spent four years working on real projects, solving real problems. And it was interesting. I was talking to some of their, their third and fourth year graduates, and they were, they were telling me things like the typical software development problems that you would find out in industry. Um, we were trying to do this and we ran out of time to test. I said, okay, so why didn't you test first? And, oh, we haven't thought about that. I said, we'll go and read up about it. Um, and so the guys would run off and they'd go and look at it and they would try it. You know, they were really trying all of these interesting disciplines and um, it was really interesting to see how these guys were growing and how they ended up at the end of their fourth years, really mature software engineers, proper software engineers that knew how to program, they knew how to build the system, um, they understood all the complexities, they understood the things that went wrong. That's that's one of the things they learned. They learned about the things that go wrong on software development projects as well. Um, this, this program continued for about six or seven years and the university stopped it. Um, and the reason they stopped it is that they, they, they found that these graduates went out into industry and as valuable as they were, they will keep people would say to them, so where's your where's your academic record from 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 university? And you know, it basically said computer science one, computer science two, computer science three, computer science four, passed. And said, Well, what subjects did you do? So we didn't do subjects. Oh, well, then you're no good. And some of these guys struggled to find work because they had done this really radical, <clears throat> amazing degree that was teaching them real skills on real projects where they learned the hard stuff. Um, and they actually had the skills where the guys that came from other universities where they just done subjects and passed the exams had no practical skills. They were the ones getting the jobs because they passed five subjects and they got distinctions in some of their subjects. And, yeah. Hey, this looks really good. This guy must be clever. Um, which was to me such a tragedy. Um, but it just proved to me that the world at the time wasn't quite ready for that. But I think the world will become ready for that. We will have to learn to do these things. And I'm saying this because um, in the last six weeks, I've come across three startup organizations. One, actually quite a big one in the UK, which is um, being driven by the ex-Prime Minister Tony Blair's son, uh, where they are doing exactly this. They're creating a, uh, an apprentice-based approach to teaching people certain skills, as opposed to the academic approach of sit in the classroom, read a book, write an exam, prove that you, that you know the knowledge, as opposed to let's go and do stuff and prove to me that you can actually do it. Mm. Um, I think I'm, I'm thinking I'm quoting I, I may be wrong but I think they they've now worked out that the average self life of a degree is now something like five or six years after five or six years all the knowledge is obsolete yeah, yeah. so I think it, it, it probably differs from discipline you know maybe yeah. not so much in, in, in something like law but certainly in, in, in tech type qualifications very much so yeah so do you really want to put people in classrooms and make them read books and uh, get them to pass exams any, any longer? Or do we, do we have to use a better approach? I think the answer is we need to find a better approach. And the thing is there, it's not an either or. Mm. It's to get really good. You will still need to read books. 
you will mm, still yes. need to master specific skills because you don't just um hey i only know how to play it's, with sticks and magically i know how to build stuff no there's a yes. lot of deep learning that needs to happen yes. Yes. anyway <laughs> yes but i think the the, the focus is different the, yeah because i think too much yeah. the, the focus <clears throat> is too much on prove to me that you read the book and that you know what's in the book um <clears throat> as opposed to show me that you can actually do this yeah mm. yeah 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 i remember many years ago <clears throat> this was mid 90s um, um i attended an international uh, contest uh, you had teams of four from various universities around the globe and we got exactly as you were saying zian here's a brief uh, you have three and a half days you start monday morning you finish thursday lunchtime let's see uh can you build this system right it's gonna uh, you're gonna get a lab uh, a whole list of, of parts you're gonna have some computers and we want you to build a microprocessor controlled digital oscilloscope so you acquire an analog signal you digitize it on the control of a microprocessor you push that signal to the pc however you see fit and you have to display it graphically on screen now this is um, the days of Windows 3.1, um, if you will, uh, Windows 95 didn't even exist. This was before 95. <clears throat> so early days when um, most computing was still kind of text-based, you had lots of DOS screens and, and, and text. So yeah. graphical things were like, whoa, not everybody knew yeah. how to deal with pixels and, and, and whatnot. So the, the, the jury was expecting that they'll see <clears throat> how we go about thinking about it and maybe um, have some small modest progress. Um, fast forward to Thursday lunchtime, our team has the system up and running perfectly, implementing every single um, element from the spec. And it also has a user guide, a technical manual and the printed out schematics to say, productionize this in three and a half days. It's like, what the hell? How do these guys get all of this done? Mm -hmm. Well, we got all of that done because we had the right kind of insight, the right kind of skills and the right kind of approach of pairing up with one another. So we were essentially working through the small cross-functional high-performance team that was mobbing on specific um, issues. And we made the right technical choices at the right junctions to have that kind of result. Mm -hmm. So it was just a complete revelation for the jury because we were so far ahead of everybody else in the competition. They couldn't understand how is it with these people. Now, two of those people um, in, that, uh, in that team of ours, well, um, they didn't even attend much the, the, the regular um, scheduled classes uh, and so on because they were so intent on putting the reps in, perfecting their, their skills and getting really, really good. So <clears throat> one of them was really, really uh, contributing to the early iterations of Linux um, uh, at the time. And the other one <clears throat> launched a very successful um, software engineering business um, in uh, Romania and later became um, the founder of, uh, of a very successful um, sort of digital uh, watch company and then got acquired by one of these massive multinationals and led their uh, engineering efforts. And the other uh, chap that was kind of into Linux is um, now serving as a, a sort of senior designer uh, of one of the, the famous, um, shall we say, um, companies out there that has um, a logo like a like a fruit. Um, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> that, uh, that that kind of thing shows, right? That, that kind of because it's not just talent, right? It's that determination to to do things really well, and it's not mm -hmm. that oh uh, you didn't attend the the classes, you didn't take the uh, the subjects. Well, well, no, I don't have. <coughs> have the, the the skills in spades because i actually can achieve useful stuff here's what we make and here's how amazing it is yeah very good um Zion, this was a really insightful um interview or a chat fireside chat thank you very much i've learned a lot from from you today and we want to just say thank you for joining us today Pleasure. It was, uh, it was fun having a chat and I've, I learned a couple of things as well. So <laughs> it's also good. Very good. 
Um, that concludes our episode. I'm Aldu. I'm Horia. Thank you. Cheers, guys. <laughs>